in Kerr County. I'm Brooke Taylor, Fox News. All right. Thank you so much uh, for that, Brooke. And let's talk more about some of what is actually happening, the realities of this, as authorities search for victims of the flash floods in Texas that killed more than 100 people over the 4th of July weekend. Social media users spreading some false claims that the devastation was caused by weather modification. Officials say there is no evidence that the floods are the results of cloud seeding, and experts agree that seeding could not result in precipitation of this magnitude. And we did hear on the ground there in the region that Senator Ted Cruz of Texas said at a press briefing earlier this week that, quote, to the best of my knowledge, there is zero evidence that anything related to anything like weather modification. When asked about speculation, he added, the Internet is a strange place. People can come up with all sorts of crazy theories. Let's bring into the conversation right now for more on this. Senior meteorologist Matthew Capucci, friend of the program. Thank you so much for joining us here on Live Now from Fox. Let's first take us back a week to when this all started. Was this the perfect storm of events in the Hill Country? So much rain it happened overnight. Can you talk about what we saw in terms of the forecast last week? Yeah, most definitely. You know, Texas Hill Country is obviously a very hilly place. They have wineries there. This is northwest of Austin, Texas. Uh, it's natural that it floods every couple generations. And oftentimes we do see significant floods every 10 to 15 years or so. In this case, though, you know, we knew the atmosphere was moisture loaded, but we didn't necessarily see a trigger. About five, six days beforehand, the remnants of Tropical Storm Barry had made landfall in Tamaulipas, Mexico, leaving just a ton of tropical moisture that wafted north into Texas. And so you have a record moisture air mass sitting there festering but no real big triggers there were no cold fronts nor warm fronts highs or lows nothing nearby to really get storms going and so at about one o'clock in the afternoon on july 3rd that thursday the national weather service did issue a flood watch basically saying yeah some flooding might happen we might see locally five to seven inches worth of rain uh, but we don't really have any widespread triggers so we're not sure how widespread this rain will be that carried into the overnight, but then things very quickly ramped up early on that Friday, the fourth morning. What happened was we had something called an MCV or a mesoscale convective vortex, basically a leftover swirl, both from Barry's remnant circulation, but just kind of leftover thunderstorms. And that sat and parked over hill country. That focused downpours got stagnant, slow moving downpours with two, three inch per hour rainfall rates, and also entrained a continuous supply of Gulf moisture to feed and nourish these downpours. And so we had incredibly high rainfall rates, very high rainfall efficiency. And so it came as no surprise in some locations over the course of four hours saw four months worth of rainfall leading to that devastating flooding. Matthew, and you mentioned that sort of trigger, and that is why people are making the jump for this to what's going on in terms of cloud seeding and weather modification. We have other experts that have said there's no way that this could have resulted in this much precipitation. Are you one of those experts? Do you agree in that assessment? Yeah, you know, it's unfortunate to see how many politicians have been espousing outlandish beliefs that 30 years ago would have landed them either socially ostracized or institutionalized. But now it's amazing. People will perpetuate these just incredibly apocryphal beliefs. You know, cloud seeding is a research thing that involves essentially nucleating clouds with condensation nuclei. So often we look up at the sky, we see clouds, there's moisture up there obviously, but it's not falling. Clouds are just floating little pockets of water. Sometimes you can get cloud droplets, which are very small and very light, to coalesce onto an object, whether it be a small salt particle, an aerosol, silver iodide, whatever, to coalesce into bigger droplets that eventually become heavy enough to fall as rain. This can add 5 to maybe 15% to any rainfall in very marginal cases. It's mainly used in very dry desert climates. We didn't need that over Texas. When the atmosphere is at 100% humidity, you have the remnants of a tropical storm moving through, you have 50,000 foot tall thunderstorms and 4 trillion gallons of water coming down. The atmosphere does not need any help. So the idea that cloud seeding is somehow manufacturing an entire massive weather system is just outlandish. And I think a lot of experts are kind of in that same realm, but cloud seeding is a real thing. The technology has improved drastically over the years since it was really evolved. Can you talk about that? How widespread is cloud seeding and how has it uh, really evolved, really advanced so far? 
You know, we're, it, it's still, interestingly enough, rather inconclusive. We, we found that, you know, 5 10% of the precipitation in very dry climates that are frequently cloud seeded can come from cloud seeding. But it's such a marginal thing. You know, if the cloud's not going to rain, we can try to nudge it a little bit, but you're only going to get a fraction of that moisture down. And this happens on a very small scale, on, you know, the scale of a couple square miles, not a massive 100 mile by 100 miles, a 10,000 square mile weather system, which was the case in Texas. And so, it's just sort of a scale argument. It's like how people think that we can somehow control hurricanes. You know, a single hurricane churns through 200 times more energy than the entirety of humanity produces on planet Earth. But there's a scale thing. And, and I think that these conspiracy theorists just don't understand scale. All right, very good. I, I do want to ask you, is there some credence to some of this research, though? Because if you could and you can't right now control some of the weathers, you can kind of predict what comes in terms of flash flooding. Is there value in the cloud seeding, at least the research, the scientific portion of it? Yeah, if you're a farmer in a really dry climate, then you'd probably be rooting on cloud seeding. If you plant a bunch of rutabagas and you want it to rain and your rutabagas are sad and dry, odds are you want a little bit more rain to come down. And, and that's realistically what cloud seeding is, is mostly for. Dubai researches it and tries to practice it because Dubai only gets three, four, five inches worth of rain per year. Yeah. They need any little bit they can get, but on the broad scale, especially over North America, you're not really going to see any meaningful difference. Maybe over portions of the desert Southwest, maybe over Arizona, possibly New Mexico, maybe Colorado, but otherwise not so much. Now, interestingly, seeding, does happen on its own sometimes. You know, back over the winter time, there was a case where you had planes landing at Denver's runway 35 right. You had super cooled water droplets at the mid-levels, and the soot coming out the back of the engines actually caused a few snowflakes to form. That happened back in November 2018 near Chicago as well. It happened back in January of or February of 2021 in Texas near Dallas. It happens naturally from time to time when you have normal United Airlines or Delta flights flying through super cold water droplets. So there's there's a science there, but it's just not widespread to the point that people, these conspiracy theorists think it is. Yeah, correct. I do want to ask you because it's so very fascinating talking about this. You mentioned the cold weather climate and we know how kind of humidity and dew point also factors into if it will rain, if it will snow. This isn't necessarily a warm weather Thing. People in like mountain resorts, ski resorts, potentially trying to do this as well could be beneficial. In terms of the warm climate, cold climate, is there any difference or does it work both in both climates potentially? We're just a little better in cold climates. The air, because the air is so much drier in cold climates, the moisture wants to fall out of the air. The moisture, the air can't hold much more moisture, so the moisture just wants to get out. And so that's why, you know, A, you can see your breath in the wintertime sometimes, but B, you know, snow resorts or snow resorts, ski resorts will manufacture their own snow through a very similar process. They're just not doing it with airplanes. They're doing it at ground level and right. you get small little ice crystals to form. It, it's kind of cool, actually. If ever you go to a, a ski yep. resort in the wintertime, you might see like what we call diamond dust or cool little sun halos because the ice crystals that are manufactured by ski resorts are so perfect, so hexagonally shaped that they make really cool refractions of the light. Just kind of a nerdy thing. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah, and it, I'm from Denver, Colorado, so full, uh, full fledged. I understand that very much as they're trying to get as much snow out there to get all the people up on the slopes. I want to ask you because you mentioned just the lawmakers commenting on some of this. Do you think there will be need to be regulation in terms of this as the technology advances? Do you think the government potentially will get involved? I think so, and and you know, I I do support regulation of you know, weather manipulation, weather manipulation in the form of cloud seeding, not because we're going to meaningfully manipulate the weather on, on broad scales, but here's a question. Let's say I'm in Eastern New Mexico and I desperately need rain, but I'm in also, yeah, there's another farm in far Western Texas near, let's say Leveland, Texas, that also needs the rain. If there's a cloud that's drifting from Eastern New Mexico into West Texas and it's going to rain eventually, but they seed it a little early and the rain falls out of it early, did that farmer in New Mexico usurp the moisture from the farmer in Texas? There are so many legal ramifications that down the road will have to become discussed if this winds up becoming something that ends up being more common. You know, it is a concern in other countries too, but it's like, for example, if you have a river on the ground that's moving through different countries and one dams it for a nuclear power plant and you reduce the flow to the other country, 
Whose fault is that? Is one usurping the other's resource? So resource management and water resource management will have to enter the equation down the road too. Yeah, we've seen so many debates, controversy over the Colorado River, water rights on the ground in terms of those rivers. You imagine it's going to happen there in the air with this. Anything else on your mind? It's so very fascinating to talk about this. I know as experts, as people saying it had no factor in what's going on in Texas. Anything else that you want to get out there that you want to share with our audience about what's going on with this? Yeah, so I'd like to discuss two different things. For starters, you know, when we talk about the laws coming or the potential legislation surrounding cloud seeding, I want to make very clear to, to viewers, to listeners, to readers, that there is a difference between this small scale research into cloud seeding, which happens on the scale of like a cumulus cloud, versus what the politicians continue to sort of push as these conspiracy theories. For example, Marjorie Taylor Greene claiming that we can manipulate hurricanes. These are two very different things, very different scales. And so if you see laws being produced regarding cloud seeding, that's probably a good thing. But these blanket laws, for example, Tennessee has one, Florida has one, Marjorie Taylor Greene recently proposed one regarding what they call chemtrails and stuff, which are really just lines of water vapor behind airplanes. Those are vastly different things. And so I want to make sure people understand that. The other thing I'll say too, I'd like to revisit Camp Mystic and the flooding in Texas and sort of get back to the root of the issue because we've investigated the time frame a little bit more. And what we found is that Camp Mystic had roughly one hour and 56 minutes notice from the time the first flash flood warning came out. And this was a considerable flash flood warning, one that would have made the emergency alert system blare on people's phones, one that would have activated NOAA weather radios. So an hour and 56 minutes from that point to the point the water first started rising. And it was another roughly two hours before the crest of that water uh, reaching you know, 37.52 feet. And so they did have several hours advanced notice. So I wanna make clear the National Weather Service in Austin, San Antonio did a great job. There was also a place called God's Hill at Camp Mystic where folks could have climbed and, and sought refuge. So my question, and I don't wanna speculate, but my question is whether they had any emergency protocols in place because it was only a five to 10 minute walk to get to a place of safety and they had hours to do so. Was anyone paying attention? Was there a no weather radio? Was there cell reception? Was anyone using satellite internet to get a warning? Of the 60 plus staffers, did anyone have a plan in place? Yeah, I think a lot of people are still asking questions like that as obviously the tragedy continues to unfold, the rescue operations still going there. Let's talk about something you mentioned. You talked about the warnings in place because this wall of water, we know it's a kind of flood prone area. They've had floods in the past, maybe not to this magnitude, but certainly big. In terms of those warnings, how precise did they get? Because we talk about the large area and then it kind of narrows down to knowing where it goes. Can you talk about some of the mechanisms in place to alert people of flash floods like this one. Okay. Yeah, so about 12 to 15 hours ahead of time, they issued a flood watch, basically saying someone in this broad area could see flooding and it could be locally significant. Granted, the amount of rainfall that fell outpaced anything that was expected in advance. So the forecasts leading up to it, I'll admit, were imperfect. However, the warning operations, when things actually began happening, the warning operations were, in my mind, absolutely stellar. And I'm the first to critique the National Weather Service. In this case, I think they did a, a darn good job with these warnings. Now, the National Weather Service has multiple different tiers of flash flood warnings. The baseline one does not trigger wireless emergency alerts. There's blaring alerts we get on our cell phones. The second and third tiers do. The second tier is called the considerable, and the third tier is a flash flood emergency, a life or death situation. The National Weather Service did issue a considerable flash flood warning at 1.14 in the morning, several hours before flooding actually ensued. And in that warning, they called out the town of Hunt basically saying, you folks are sort of red line, center line to get this eventual deluge. By 3 a.m., they're using verbiage like, act now, act quickly to protect your life, evacuate to higher ground. At 4 a.m., a flash flood emergency was issued, that immediate life or death warning, and by 5 a.m., that wall of water was moving in. And, you know, I, I want to emphasize that several hours notice for a flash flood warning is rather atypical. That's an exceptional amount of warning. You know, the average lead time for a tornado warning is 12 to 14 minutes. When we get a tornado warning though, culturally we're like, yeah, let's act right now, let's get to shelter. But when we get a flash flood warning, I feel like the general public does not do that. 
This camp was built in a floodplain. Even a run-of-the-mill flood would cause inundation of some of the cabins there, especially those occupied by the younger students. This was a, a top-tier, high-end flood event, and I, I want to make clear that anytime someone gets a flash flood warning on their phone, they should act. In this case, I genuinely wonder what went down in those two to three hours that you know, folks there had to, to move to safety. I, can I ask, because there are conversations now about new implementation of safety protocols, sirens in place. Are those normal? Because we hear about tornado sirens for different parts of kind of tornado alley. Is flash flood sirens, could they be beneficial and how do they work exactly? Same thing. And, and to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of sirens. And, and here's why. For any pet owners out there, if your pet does something wrong and you shout your pet's name, the pet doesn't know why you're shouting his or her name. The pet just says, uh-oh, you know. In my mind, the same thing is true with sirens. If you have just a, a huge blaring noise in the middle of the night, that's assuming people know what this huge blaring noise means. If I hear a huge blaring noise out my window right now, I'm in Washington, D.C., I say, what the heck is that? Is that a tornado siren? Is that a flood siren? Is that a, uh, an air raid siren? What is that? And so given that you have campers coming from all over the place, having sirens would require everybody to know what that siren meant and would require having a procedure ahead of time. You know, we live in the era where with cell phones, everybody can get an alert on their phone, assuming they have cell service. If not, they have Wi-Fi, they can trust a weather app to do that too. Now I work for a weather app. We send buzzes and we, we let people know when a flash flood warning is issued. Uh, so to me, it's less about sirens and less about audible noises and more about having a plan because I find it difficult to believe that out of 60 people, nobody knew there was a significant flash flood warning in effect. My question is, was there a plan in place ahead of time? Now, the state of Texas did visit this camp two days before the flooding to ensure they had an emergency action plan. The law in Texas does not say that they have to copy this plan, that they have to you know, document it. They just have to check with the camp and say, hey, do y'all have a plan? And the camp said yes. Texas signed off and said great. So my question is, what was in that plan? Was it followed? And did anyone take into account the fact that, you know, flooding can happen quickly, flooding can happen at inconvenient times? I think so often, you know, as meteorologists, we drill into people what to do, but people think it's going to come holding a big signpost. Emergencies don't walk up with a signpost and say, hey, I'm an emergency. Emergencies require you to rely on training ahead of time. It's like a fire alarm. We all know what to do when the fire alarm goes and it's automatic. People need to have this automatic reaction to tornado warnings, flash flood warnings, et cetera. All right, that is good. And there's a lot of questions out there, like you mentioned, Matthew, about why this all happened and what could have been done to potentially prevent it. And like you mentioned, some of those protocols in place, they drill it into us. And it also sometimes becomes white noise, but people definitely need to pay attention when they get those on their phones or through their apps or whatever. Matthew Kabuchi, thank you so much. I appreciate your time as always here on Live Now. Anytime. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. All right. Great conversation, as always, discussing some of those top headlines around those deadly Texas floodings. I'm Andy Mack. We're back after this.